Okay, with that, let's move on to part three of our discussion. Um, and this one's going to begin with a presentation by uh, Bill Kovacic, who we're very glad to have with us. Uh, and the discussants for this one will be Natalie Harsdorf, who's the Acting Managing Director of the Austrian Competition Authority, and Michel Mia, uh, Senior Policy Fellow at UCL uh, and author of a very well-selling book. Uh, Bill, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Just to uh, bring up the slides here first. Yeah, we're, we're delighted to have the opportunity to participate in the research project and especially grateful to the Secretariat of the Competition Committee. Uh, Chris, Lynn, thank you for the chance to be part of this wonderful initiative. And I'm also uh, most grateful to uh, two of our students who are my research assistants, uh, Mariana Fernandez and Destiny Stokes, who are reason to hope for a better world in the future. They're going to solve all the problems and it's been a, a, a wonderful opportunity for me to work with them as well. So thanks to all for the chance to, to do this. Uh, I want to talk about an issue that we've touched upon a bit today, which is how to do this, how to actually carry it out, to go from the idea to its uh, realization and uh, to focus on First, the context in which authorities would take on consideration of a gender inclusive policy, uh, to speak about how directly or indirectly to incorporate the consideration in the way in which agencies set priorities and choose products, which is the delivery end of what agencies do. Uh, and to talk about a collection of research projects that agencies or others could undertake to see how this is working out in practice. In talking about this, I'm drawing upon my own experiences and giving you my own views, but I'm very much influenced by my current experience as a non-executive director on a board at the United Kingdom Competition and Markets Authority, uh, and on my experience at the USFTC where I worked in the ship, uh, in the boiler room, putting coal in the boilers up to being on the bridge to being the chair, to see it top to bottom, and many opportunities to think about how one actually goes about, goes about doing this. Uh, why care? Uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of one of the most important publications on political science and public administration. It's Graham Allison's classic on the Cuban Missile Crisis, The Essence of Decision. And he ends his book with a fairly gloomy chapter on policy implementation and notes, if analysts and operators are to increase their ability to achieve desired policy outcomes, we shall have to find ways of thinking harder about the problem of implementation. That is the path between the preferred solution and the act actual performance of government. How do you get from the aspirations to the actual fulfillment of those aspirations in practice inside of a competition agency which, as I'll mention in a moment, is being asked to do a number of other things, too. Uh, why is implementation important? Uh, let me use a moonshot example. The physics of going to the moon and coming back were pretty straightforward. The big idea, some fancy mathematics involved, but the physics was relatively straightforward. The implementation was really hard. None of the capabilities necessary when this initiative was announced in the United States in 1961, none of the capabilities necessary to do it existed. They all had to be created. And this is the hard part that we tend to overlook. And that's what I want to try to address here is implementation. If you have great physics and bad engineering, um, you have a policy fiasco. So how to get the engineering in motion to satisfy the aspirations that are built into the physics of gender inclusiveness. Uh, what's the context for the typical agency today? I'd like to situate our conversation today in a larger set of discussions about what agencies should do. And there's a multiplicity of policy demands. Who runs the agencies? Typically people who aren't gonna be there very long, a few years maybe. At the outer bounds, five years. Are they going to make investments during their tenure that will last? Or are they worried about what happens by the time they leave 
and ribbon cutting ceremonies they can have before they walk out the door. How many leaders are gonna take on the idea of making investments that significantly outlast their own time? And I'd suggest that what we've been talking about today requires a longer term investment and a longer term perspective. In effect, to build things for which others will ultimately get the credit and they will not, but they have to make the investments now. And I'd also say that you have to persuade the staff of the agency, why? They've heard talks in the past about reforms, improvements, they've heard leadership make wonderful promises. And they are very skeptical about cliches, fads, slogans, and Potemkin village facades. Because one way to address everything we've been talking about today is a, a new mission statement, hooray for that. Uh, some declarations about what we're going to do and how to do it and then hand that off to someone else. Uh, so we have t-shirts, we have baseball caps, we have book bags, but do we have policies that really work in the day-to-day -day operation of the agency? And I would simply say that career staff have seen it all. They've watched this movie before in different contexts. So how do you generate an ending that is a positive ending with this story? Some thoughts about how to do that. Um, Last is uh, when we look at the competition roundtables of the competition committee uh, since 1995, this is a subset of the topics that the committee has suggested agencies should take into account. Achieve sustainability, green growth, promote democracy, human rights, employment corruption, poverty reduction, corporate governance, improve innovation, enhance consumer protection, more energy security, of course, a fairer society, gender, and there are more to come perhaps race. So what you're telling case handlers and managers is do all of this. And if I'm a case handler or manager, I look back at you and say, how? How do I do all of that in order to accomplish the ends of the agency? Some thoughts about how to do that. But that's the context in which one is turning to agencies and say, do one more thing. I mean, Gunnar mentioned before that, well, it's their job, do it. Yes, but I'd like to know how in a way that I can fit into the larger program. And these are not idle concerns. These are legitimate concerns. These are valid concerns, urgent concerns. But at the agency, I'm being asked to do all of these things. And at the end of each of these events, the chair of the committee very solemnly says, all of you agencies should be focusing on doing this. Go back and do your job right. And if I'm a case handler or a manager, I say, how? Have ideas about that? I do have some ideas about that. Uh, ideally, what do you want in thinking about implementation? Well, you want it to be effective and that you're thinking carefully about how to set incentives and organization inside the agency that provide an enabling environment in which to accomplish these aims. So one dimension of it is thinking about how is your organization designed, structured? How does it actually perform in practice? And I'll suggest that one important consideration for at least indirectly elevating prioritization and project selection to take account of this is who's running the show. Do you have a representative agency? That's an important place to start in making this work. Uh, second, how do you make it credible? If your staff and your managers do not think it is genuine and sincere, they will take superficial steps to reflag their programs to embrace your objectives and they'll wait till you go. And then they'll get back to what they've been doing before. So how do you persuade people that this matters and are you in it for the long run? This is Eric Potashnik's wonderful book about reforms where Eric says, getting the reform in place is only the beginning. Sustaining them is what matters because as he puts it, the threats of reversal or erosion may be even tougher than winning the reforms adoption in the first place. So how do you build this into the very fabric of what an agency does? And now I'm gonna answer these questions for you based on the work we've done so far. Approaches to do this. Uh, I look at it from two directions, what might be called the demand side and the supply side. On the supply side, where is gender important? Do women have opportunities to realize the fullest expression of their creative and entrepreneurial talents as entrants into the marketplace? 
So are markets permeable and porous in ways that invite their contributions? As owners as well, in many instances, as owners of enterprises, frequently smaller enterprises. And yes, as employees, taking into account what we've just mentioned, wage disparities, limits on working conditions that ultimately filter them out. And my own intuition is that a society that taps the broader talent available to it will be more prosperous and probably will undergo a greater sense of broader social satisfaction. It's just about talent. Are you giving talent the opportunity to realize its highest potential? So one focuses in part in prioritization and project selection is what can you do to ensure effective market participation by women as entrants, as owners, and as employees. Second, as consumers of goods and services, we just mentioned the interesting case of, of daycare, for example, childcare, the variety of areas in which it matters. Uh, are you serving that very large part of the population that happens to be women? Are you taking account of their interests as consumers as well? That's the demand side with respect to goods and services. And are you devoting adequate attention to markets that have an unusually significant effect on women as buyers of goods and services? So from two directions, an agency addresses this. Market participation, market outputs. Strategies for implementation. I'm going to focus on four in particular. I'm gonna talk about personnel. I'm gonna talk about structure, selection criteria embedded in the decision about how to use resources, and another topic we have touched upon today, the importance of research and development as a crucial tool for the agency to effectuate these changes. And last, to anticipate one point where I see the Competition Commission of South Africa as being absolutely on the frontier with best practice, is that when you develop selection criteria, you tell the world what you're doing. And you give guidance and you invite a larger public debate about your program. And in that respect, our South African colleagues can say more about that, but they've been the very best in taking a broader view about what agencies should do and explaining to the larger world, this is how we do it. If you've got a better idea, we're listening. First and foremost, I think an agency begins by taking a detailed look at how its personnel configuration has developed over time and where it stands now. And my intuition here is that if you have a broader representation of women in key decision-making capacities that will at least indirectly move the agency in the direction to including gender-specific considerations more directly in program design. So the starting point for this audit is, who leads your agency? Who have been the heads of your agency going back 30 years to the present? Who's been on your board if you have a multi-member decision-making body? Who have your senior managers been, unit by unit? And what about your case handlers and staff at all three levels? You ought to be able to trace over time how you're doing in this respect and to notice changes. And if those numbers are stunningly low, that tells you a lot about what you have to do right there without dealing with a variety of other specific projects. I would state the, pro the problem more directly if you are doing badly on these dimensions, you will fail. And not simply from the point of view of developing your program, you're missing a great game because you're missing the talent and a large part of it. So what would be a gender inclusive program? Do this first. But it requires self-assessment and examination about what you're doing. And then yes, how are you recruiting people in all of these dimensions? How do you promote and compensate? And very important, do you have working conditions that provide flexibility? Maybe a positive consequence of this healthcare calamity has been we are alert to possibilities for people having more flexible work schedules, more flexible working environments where you don't have to be at your desk in the office all the time and still do a superb job. So how does your recruiting and personnel pro program determine who ends up atop your agency, who manages key units, and who's in the staff. Second, you do an organizational audit to look at how your agency makes decisions. And this requires, again, an honest 
and very direct assessment of how you do business internally. Crucially, what are the committees and working groups that have power inside the agency? What is the screening group that gives a green light or a red light to a proposed project? And who informs their decisions about what to do and not to do? And again, if those are all white guys, that tells you a lot about, I think, how they're going to go about reviewing projects. Do you have women in that group? Do you have people of color? Who's making the key decisions and is your institution representative given the body of population that you have? And by the way, if it is representative, I think you're able to pick up considerations that I mentioned on the larger collection of initiatives that the OECD, OECD has pursued in its roundtables. A vital starting point. And yes, where you have that subsidiary group of individuals who tee up the proposals that go to the executive committee, that go to the agenda setting bodies, who's on those teams too? Who's doing that work? And what are they looking for? What are they prompted to do? So the structural organizational audit is to look at who makes decisions and ask who's in those groups. Uh, this is not easy for an organization to do, either of these. My dentist, when I see my wonderful dentist sometimes says, this is gonna hurt a little. Uh, well, this is going to hurt a little because you have to look very carefully at what you have done and who you are. And in a way that has no sentiment or self-delusion to lay out precisely who makes decisions and how those decisions are made. I think these basic steps, if I stopped right here, this tells you a lot about how to make gender a more important factor in shaping the substantive program. It's got to begin there. I won't necessarily assert to you this is sufficient to achieve the aims that we've been talking about today, I will say it's necessary. And if you don't do this, I think we can go back to the coffee bar and spend the rest of the day today simply sipping a double espresso. How do you set priorities? Uh, this is another area of the self-assessment, and this is part of what we are doing. I'm, I'm using the case of the agency I work for, for more than any other, the FTC in the US, but I think you look in context, how have you allocated resources in the past? At an aggregate level, are you focusing on sectors where the benefits of good enforcement are likely to fall in significant measure on the female population? Are you doing that as a whole? That is, are you spending a lot of your budget on the luxury yacht cartel market? Are you spending most of your resources on the beer industry, on sports cars costing more than a quarter of a million dollars a year, things that go really fast and make a lot of noise, is that the core of your budget? Or, and this is the interesting part for the FTC, energy, clothing, healthcare, food. And I think a consequence I see in that of going back is what you discover is that a number of the objectives we've been talking about to some extent have been realized. Why is that important? In suggesting another perspective, I think it's very valuable to go to your agency and say, you've done it before. You didn't know you were doing it. It was not a conscious part of policy making, but it's not a great step for you to take this on because it's already in some ways embedded in your habits. But you only see what those habits are if you go back and say, where has the money been spent in the past? And at a more granular level, to break out year by year by year, what have your cases been? What mergers have you challenged? In what markets? Non-merger matters would have been the subjects of your examination. And then you take some of the criteria we've been talking about before, and you match up the criteria with what's actually been happen happening. You single out matters that have been positive. You look at other areas and say, do we want to change the mix and how we do that? But I'd suggest in terms of data that's at your hands, big antitrust data that you've got in the house, you start by looking at that in a systematic way to get an idea of what you've already done well, what you can adapt, and how you change the mix over time. I think a vital focus of enforcement priorities is mobility barriers. That is, where are the obstacles to new business development that put a stop sign in the face of women entrepreneurs and market entrants? and prevent the evolution of new business models 
which if they emerge will have a disproportionate benefit for women. In this examination of FTC experience, I am struck at the number of cases the FTC has pursued that have allowed women who are paraprofessionals in different professional markets to enter the market and provide services. Formative cases in the 1970s dealing with nurse midwives. Formative cases involving dental technologists, paraprofessionals who can clean your teeth, subject to the supervision of a dentist. Legal assistants, people who do title searches in real estate transactions, opening the door to people who, one, have real skills to offer, two, might not necessarily be full-time workers, flexibility in the work schedule, three, Lots of the candidates who do the work are women. So we mentioned today as well, contractual restrictions that affect mobility, non-compete clauses in particular. But if I had to structure my priority program and priority selection, I would be telling my case handlers generally, I want sectors that have broad significance for women. I want that to be a major focus of our concern. At a more gradual, granular level, I want to look more carefully at the kinds of cases we brought, but I want a positive program involving law enforcement and advocacy that focuses on mobility barriers, because that's going to determine access to the market. Everything from who can operate a food truck to sell food products from their home, starting a small locally owned bakery, being a healthcare provider on a part-time basis or doing other services, I want to open the door for people who otherwise aren't going to have a chance to play. And what I'm going to use is the OECD toolkit. I'm going to use the regulatory policy toolkit to ask the basic questions. Why is the restriction there taken on its own terms? Is there a good fit between the restriction and the good policy objective it's trying to serve? Is there a more pro-competitive way to achieve the result? And how's it all working out in practice? To do this well involves a conscious investment in what I'd call policy research and development. As I suggested, a starting point is that you do a careful assessment of personnel appointment and mobility trends inside your agency. Who runs the agency? Who runs key units? Who's on your staff? Who makes key decisions on key policy-making committees about what you're going to do and how to do it? And have you been real re allocating your resources? You ought to be able to construct a very informative profile of this going back over decades. By the way, you should do that anyway. If I asked you, how have you been spending your money over the last 30 years? What have been the targets of your cartel enforcement program? And yes, Europeans, aren't you struck about how many firms you have engaging in four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cartels over a 10 year period of time? Gee, they're here again. Doesn't that tell you something about deterrence? And doesn't it tell you something to go to the point about cartel reconstructions? Shouldn't a vital element of every settlement be you are going to do a reconstruction of how the cartel happened? You are going to inform us. And you're going to tell us how this happened. Just as in the transportation sector, if we have a crash, we have a careful assessment of how we happen. We would do the same thing for these cartel collisions that destroy commerce. You're going to go back and look at each one. And I'm sure the private firms will, of course, be willing to help in that instead of saying, oh, no, that's too hard to do. I don't want to simply move on to the next one. I want that detailed reconstruction. And I want market studies and research that looks carefully at consumption patterns, trends in market participation, and how we assess the effect of earlier cases that have had some impact in the areas that we're concerned about. And one area to carry this forward is, I think there's a vital need for ongoing public consultations. How do you find out where the problems are? My goodness, you ask. You convene regular events. It's not a one-off. It's not just today, a good day that it is. You do this on a regular basis. And you come back and say to larger outside audiences, what are we getting right and what are we missing? Where should we be looking? That will help guide you in the direction of a more effective way to choose priorities and projects that matter. But that's got to be a regular initiative. That's not a one-off. If you're not doing that at least once a year in a systematic basis, you're not sincere about this. <laughs>
And as I mentioned before, you do what the Competition Commission of South Africa has done is that you explain to the outside world how you're taking this on. You talk about how this is working in your prioritization and project selection principles. You're talking about how you make choices in individual cases. Why did I focus on these and not those? And this is why I'm doing it. It makes the selection process legitimate. It gives you sources of ideas about how you could do it better. And again, that has to be a regular part of your process, not a two-year initiative that goes away after incumbent leadership leaves. So the research agenda One going minute, Bill, please. Ask whether or not I've got this right. First, do the personnel choices really do affect your program? If women run your agency, does it matter? And we've got some experience with that now. Does participation in the key governance decisions change the mix? And how have past activities facilitated better market access and mobility? That is, you have a program, go back and look and see if my intuition about this is right. And again, how do we assess the specific as aspect? And concluding thought, what do you need? Two things here to make this work. You need ambition to go ahead. Jack Kennedy tells the Congress in 1961, by the end of the decade, we're going to the moon and we're coming back. But before he did that, he went to NASA and said, can we do this? Can you give me a plan about how we're going to do this? I'd like to be done by 1968. That would be the end of my second presidential term. They said, nope, end of the decade. And that means all of 1970 if we need it. So ambition to press ahead, realism about what it takes to do to do the engineering to get there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bill. That was very, uh, very impressive. A lot to take in. Um, let's go to Natalie first. Thanks. Is Natalie there? She is listed as being here. Yes, I'm here. Sorry, do you hear me now? Yes, sorry, that's it. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. Um, so, hi, thanks for inviting me. And um, I remember the first time this topic was raised in the competition committee by my Canadian colleagues. And I was immediately really interested into it because there was something about this gender lens in competition enforcement and policy that had been bothering me for a long time in the back of my mind. Like, why are we not talking about it? Is there something there? Um, and I remember the very blank faces in the audience wondering, like, sh we're enforcers, like, we have so much on our minds already, similar to what Bill was saying before, like, we have so many things we have to think about, why should we deal with this as well? And, um, and then the whole thing got such a dynamic, and now so many people are interested in this, so I'm really fascinated by this process, and I think the OECD Secretariat has done an amazing job to really push this topic forward so a lot to be learned from from that and um on this particular project that uh, bill just presented i really like it that uh, bill is leading this because i think uh, to understand how to make it relevant to an enforcer you need to have been working for an enforcement and and knowing how a case handler would think about this uh, and alessandra also mentioned this that we have to think about how do we make this topic practically relevant um, so that it really works for agencies and it's not only a, a fancy topic that we talk about at nice conferences and then in two years we talk about a different topic. Um, so um, if you look at agencies worldwide, I think they're extremely diverse. So also um, they have to deal with very different setups um, when it comes to taking the gender lens. So you cannot really for example, me coming from a prosecutorial agency, we have much more limited um, prioritization possibilities because we follow this pure prosecutorial model compared to other agencies. Also, we already have some public policy considerations in our law that we have to take into account. Um, maybe also size and resources plays a role here. Uh, when you try to do this kind of review processes that we just heard about that you sh every agency should probably do, also a lot depends how many resources do you really have to conduct that we already have to do review processes nor how we spend our money um, 
we have to give a report to Parliament how much money we bring uh, in terms of uh, real money, fines, but also in terms of economic value to, to the economy. And now we also have to evaluate um, the gender perspective. So that's on top of that. Um, and uh, I, I have really uh, tried and launched this discussion in our agency. Uh, and what uh, we have found very hard is to analyze in a, a more academic, scientific way how prioritization decisions have been taken, really. So I think here uh, it also uh, launches this thought process about should we make these processes more transparent um, so that maybe later leadership can check why has these, um, have these priorities been taken uh, and why have you taken these cases and not um, the others. So I think uh, with some agencies, it's easier to do this kind of research to the past than in others, depending how your um, setup is. So I've been thinking, listening to the presentation of Bill, I've been thinking, how can you make this work, this process work with um, less effort also for smaller agencies um, that cannot conduct a huge research project into what they have been doing. So that's, that's one uh, thought I've been having. The other point I would like to mention is that from my personal perspective, uh, having started at the agency at a time where there was no woman in the leadership and, and, and I became the first woman in a leadership position in the agency, I could see hands on that even the fact that I was part of the decision making bodies in the agency changed a lot. Because of course I had a say in, in the appointments, I had a say when it came to flexibility of work times and I brought in a different perspective. So I was able to, to change a lot and had this huge opportunity um, to change things. Um, but uh, having started as a case handler, by the way, anecdotal fun fact, my first case was a beer cartel. So <laughs> since beer was mentioned, but um, reflecting on that, preparing for the session, I was also thinking a lot about how can you institutionalize these processes? Because a lot depends, and Bill already mentioned that, on the people in leadership, on their personal views. So how do you institutionalize the, the gender lens um, uh, and avoid that with revolving doors, this becomes maybe a less fancy topic and gets gets lost again. And um, that also led me to, to think about, um, is there a difference between taking the gender lens and, um, and gender considerations and other public policy goals that we have to worry about as enforcers? Is there something that makes it more outstanding, more lasting, more important that we should always integrated in the future, that it's not only a trend. I think it is, but uh, I would be interested to hear Bill's views um, about uh, that as well. And um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, let's go to Michelle before we, we go back to Bill. Michelle? Well, as everybody else has said, um, you know, con massive congratulations to the OECD team. This is a really fantastic um, initiative and a really fabulous discussion and, and, and kind of diversity of people who are involved in it. And um, thanks to Bill for a really stimulating um, presentation. Um, one of the points that um, Bill mentioned towards the end of his presentation was about data. And I think that in terms of, you know, what data do we actually gather about the effectiveness of um, of agency activities at the broadest level. I mean, I think one of the things that we can take from the um, growing economic evidence around market concentration and, um, and margins and so on, is that even if an agency has a, a pure laser focus, in this case, um, you know, historically on say consumer welfare in a very narrow economic sense, it can nevertheless miss the mark and we end up with um, you know, price rises anyway. So I would like to kind of, uh, I suppose, embellish this uh, kind of uh, call for data to say that we really need to be quite strategic about how we're going to measure whether we are successful um, in, when we are applying the gender lens. You know, have a really deep think about what kinds of data the authorities should be out actually kind of set up to gather on a very systematic um, basis. Um, one of the things that uh, Bill mentioned a few times was this um, 
need to consult on a very broad basis. I would say we need to do it more than once a year, and I'm sure that um, you know he, he would welcome more. And I think that there are there are one of my questions will be uh, how how do we actually do that? But I think it also creates a new role for the agencies in terms of their competition advocacy. Generally, competition advocacy is focused on um, you know, creating a competition culture, making businesses aware um, of their legal obligations under the competition laws. But there's also a broader stakeholder um, capacity building that could be done so that actually it is, you know, the broader public is actually in a uh, kind of their capacity is enabled so they can actually engage with these discussions because I think competition is such a kind of niche area and it's not generally in the public discourse. If we start applying things like the gender lens, will that make sense to the regular public? I would like to challenge this premise um, that you need to start with the HR decisions within the agency, that it's about who runs the agency and who is the staff, etc. One of the uh, comments that Bill made is that we should be doing this anyway. I completely agree. You know, we should have absolutely been looking at why is it, are there biases in the way that we recruit? Is this happening at the pipeline level? What, you know, what law schools are we recruiting from? Where do the law schools get their, um, their staff? What about, uh, sorry, their students? What about civil service more generally, economists? So there, I mean, I think that absolutely there should be more gender balance um, within agency staff. I do not, however, think that it is determinative in the substantive question of how we apply competition law. And the reason I say that is because I think there's a real temptation when we talk about a subject like gender to inevitably end up in the kind of uh, the realm of tokenism. The idea that as long as we have an agency run by a woman and that um, all of her head staff are women, that somehow she will magically let go of all of the education that she's had, which has been in predominantly um, you know, male run institutions in the past and suddenly adopt a kind of new way of, of thinking. So I would say if I were to be appointed the first ever brown female chair and or you know, CEO of the CMA tomorrow and I went out with a broad gender um, agenda, gender agenda, you know what I mean, <laughs> um, I don't think that that would be successful, honestly, because I think that there needs to be something much deeper and so I, while I'm an idealist, so I think that, um, you know, that's why it's fantastic we have somebody like Bill running this project, somebody who's um, has the kind of practical realist um, perspective. I also think that we need to consider the broader paradigm shift that would be necessary in order for us to be seriously taking gender in uh, you know, building that into the substantive um, assessment of competition law. I also think that we have to, um, you know, think about connected to that, how do we avoid this being the flavor of the month, you know, alongside state and sustainability and so on. And again, I think that that comes from a kind of broader change within the understanding of the competition community. So, all, you know, these things aren't separate. If the competition community starts to accept sustainability as an issue, broader public policy interests, starts to look at the models in South Africa, starts to look at the models in other agencies that have remits that go beyond consumers, then gender fits quite nicely into that. If, however, we double down on, you know, efficiency and so on, I don't think it really matters who's running that agency, to be honest. And I, I'll just end on one final kind of point, which is that I think the childcare issue that's been mentioned just in the last um, half hour is really illustrative because it shows the potential for um, falling into a little bit of a trap when we talk about gender. Childcare is not a women's issue. This is an issue that affects men as well. In fact, the more we say it's a women's issue, the more it becomes only a women's issue, as if it is the responsibility of women to ensure that the childcare is sorted so that they can go out to work. Now, I know that nobody was suggesting that, you know, this is, you know, the, only the responsibility of women, but I think it highlights the kind of sensitivities when we're thinking about um, gender, which is why I think that, you know, there are many people who've spent decades really deeply looking at issues of gender, um, whether it's in you know, uh, ac ac academics or economists or lawyers or you know, public thinkers or so on. I think we need to really think about who we are consulting and maybe draw on some of the, um, their expertise so that as we go forward with this really bold and really you know, highly supportive of this agenda, I think it's fantastic, but I think we need to be looking beyond kind of our own spheres of knowledge. So my question to Bill um, would be, 
who would be the right stakeholders? Who are the good stakeholders that we should be consulting with? And how can they actually practically be incorporated into the prioritization process? So are they consulted on a regular basis? Do we have kind of round tables? You know, what is the, should agencies be going out into the sticks and you know, going into the different regions and, and holding kind of regular consultations? And should there be, for example, standing um, for civil society groups to challenge inaction by agencies. So what are the kind of enforcement mechanisms or kind of accountability mechanisms that would actually hold um, agencies to account when applying the gender lens? But uh, you know, some of that has sounded like a criticism. I'm really um, supportive of, of this project and I, I love Bill's presentation and I think that the, the thrust is, is, is absolutely there. So uh, thank you for that. Thanks very much, Michelle. Uh, Bill, any uh, responses on uh, both Natalie and uh, Michelle's comments? No, thanks for the thanks for the comments, and thanks for the the great thought that went into uh, into into uh, into both. Um, um, on Natalie's uh, observations, uh, I certainly in my my experience in working with smaller institutions, when you tell them to do more research and devote more work to overhead. Uh, their eyes glaze over. Uh, they want to give you a cold cup of coffee and send you out the door because you're asking them to to do more with uh, to do more with uh, with uh, uh, very badly constrained resources. I mean, to my mind, uh, this is an ideal area to do something that has come up in the course of the competition committee discussions and in other forums. Uh, it's the idea of a closer alliance between agencies and research institutions outside their walls, what uh, Ellen Fells uh, famously referred to as co-producers. And this is where academic hubs in particular, I think, can help perform this role, that is to assist in uh, the accumulation and analysis of data. And the data I have in mind, by the way, in many instances, is right inside the walls of the agency. Uh, it's there. It's a matter of assembling it and using it. Uh, I mean, ideally, uh, what the CMA has done in creating, and I'm, this is a commercial for, for my, in a sense, my home institution now, creating a data team with 40 people to do data and data analytics is, is the wave of the future. A smaller institution can't do that, but I, I, I wonder whether this is an area where an agency consciously has to think about building partnerships with other research institutions to do this kind of work. Um, and you're so right, uh, Natalie, about, about the constraints that an agency faces with existing specific policy demands. It says, do this first, and you're adding another thing to the agenda, uh, limits on resources and the amount of discretion they have to make choices. So uh, 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 as, as, as you suggest, and it's a, it's a powerful reminder all the time that, that the point at which you begin talking about implementation starts at an agency level in a jurisdiction, in a context uh, where some of the broader notions I've been talking about have to be adapted. But I think for a smaller institution, finding partners on the outside is, is, is really important. Uh, on Michelle's points, I think, I think when you go back to the beginning of my presentation, um, I, I detest fads. I hate short-term uh, 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 short -term events. And it's not just that I detest them, but the staff detests them. They're not fooled. Nobody's fooled by the slogans. And, uh, and, and, and what any manager has to do, uh, any manager today who is talking about doing these things is going to have to convince your people that you're in it for the long term or that the policy's in it for the long term, or it's just going to become uh, another bit of the detritus of public administration that disappears. And, uh, and you're worse off because of it. It is worse to make a promise, aspiration, and commitment that cannot be fulfilled, because that means the next time you make a commitment, that will be believed even less. So I'm with you all the way on building things that, uh, that, that endure. Um, and when I talked about appointments and personnel, remember I said necessary, not sufficient. Uh, but I don't think if you do get the broader representation across your population and the institution, I don't think these other things have a, have a chance of sticking, in part because even the best intentioned outsider, not member of the group, is not going to have an intuition uh, that is crucial to making decisions about these things. Uh, the combination of experience and intelligence 
will not come together to form the institution. So I think you have to have uh, that that kind of kind of background. Um, uh, you know who to consult? Community groups, academics. You work at the local community level. Community activist groups, social organizations, churches, advisory bodies that do work for a whole host of groups. Learning about how commerce happens in these different areas. And I think there are some pretty good measurement tests you can use. One of the most important is, is access to the market increasing? That is, are you seeing a larger number of women as entrepreneurs coming into markets or not? Uh, what's the rate of new business development that has women as leading figures in the process? That's something you can track all the time. And, and that's a, for me, that's a powerful metric to look at what's, uh, what's, what's taking place. But the consultation process, yeah, it's more than once a year. It's a regular basis, but you do a map of, and, and a number of agencies do this, by the way. They do this. You have a map of these larger social, economic, commercial, non-commercial NGO community, and you talk to them. And you ask, what are we missing? What are we, what are we getting right? By the way, um, I'm a lot more saying, I, I, think, I think there's an illusion in our field that competition policy has been guarded by, guided by this myopic concern on prices. Uh, when I do this larger examination of what agencies do, what's the hidden secret? They care a lot about innovation. There's a powerful distributional element built in there. So my point in saying an agency ought to look at, but at its body of work is that if you look at that, you'll be surprised what you find there. And you'll see that your focus has been a lot broader, that it's an unsupportable caricature to say the only thing you've cared about is short-term price effects. Not quite so. And by showing them, look, you've already done it. You can do it again. Uh, it's not scary to think about reframing uh, the picture. But, uh, but thanks to both of you for enormously informative comments. This will make our, our work a lot better going ahead. We're in your debt. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think we need to push on to the next uh, section. So apologies, we can't um, discuss further on this one. But uh, uh, yes, so let, let's move over to um, Mbumi, uh, Betty and Sonia. Um, I'm not sure which one of you is, is showing slides, but please go ahead. Um, I think my slides should be up now. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to first thank everyone for participating in this workshop um, and especially the OECD um, for this great opportunity to really get into this very important topic. And I will be presenting on the prioritization and public interest approach section of the workshop. Um, and I'm presenting with my colleague Mbumi Shabalala. Um, and we're working, we're working on this project with another colleague, Sonia Palate, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. And just to note, um, you know, the views we say in this presentation, obviously said in our own personal um, capacity. Um, so we'll, I'll first give a bit of a background um, on South African competition law and the role of public interest consideration. Um, I think it's very important just following from the thread of the previous discussion to, you know, consider how we can incorporate gender in competition law and policy in order to address gender inequality. And we think that South Africa has a lot of lessons to offer in this regard. Um, and I think one very important and common thing that has come out of the previous discussion is that we really need to think about what it is that we seek to achieve um, as that will address and direct the level of um, intervention and willingness to really be radical in order to bring about the necessary policy changes to address gender inequality. Um, and this is something that South Africa has done. Um, it has been very radical in its approach to um, addressing racial inequalities through competition law. And I think it just might be worth it to also note that, you know, a lot of research on racial injustice has really set out a very key statement that we should be thinking about as we approach, um, you know, competition law and gender. And that statement is that systems do not maintain themselves, even our lack yes. of intervention is an act of maintenance. Every structure um, in every society is upheld by the active and passive assistance of other human beings. Um, 
so just to get into our presentation in the background section, um, I think it's also important to note that we're obviously in a time where we are reevaluating the purpose and role of competition law and policy in our present day societies, which is very important and exciting. Um, however, this is a process that South Africa really began over 25 years ago by adopting a competition law that seeks to address the country's um, historical and current racial inequalities, especially the racially biased allocation of resources. Um, and like most countries, South Africa obviously could not afford to completely turn a blind eye to the possibilities of using competition law to advance historically disadvantaged individuals. Um, and a key thing on how the Competition Act ad, ad sort of defines historically disadvantaged individuals is that it lives gender and focuses solely on race, which is something my colleague Mbumi will touch on. Um, so the South African um, agenda or competition law agenda in relation to addressing racial inequalities has been labeled by some, you know, as mostly as an improper use of competition law and policy. Um, but from our analysis of the 25 years of competition law enforcement in South Africa, it's really clear that public interest considerations can be compatible with competition law. Um, but at the same time, we do recognize that this unique regulatory approach does give rise to some complexities. However, those complexities um, do not justify leaving out all socioeconomic factors or objectives in a competition law. And I think um, that Ariel Israqi's quote, which is out in the presentation, really captures this point nicely. Um, I'll just hand over to my colleague Mbumi to give more background on the importance and the agency of a gender inclusive competition law, especially from a South African perspective. Thanks, Betty. Um, jumping right in. Uh, these statistics in South Africa are incredibly harrowing. Um, what they demonstrate to you is that what, from an economic perspective, Women are indeed maligned um, from access to any, well, from access to um, social mobility when it comes to economic advantage. And the other thing that I think that this set of statistics really highlights is what we've touched on in a couple of these presentations, which is that it's intersectional. It's intersectional. And the South African story, um, as you can see, black women, their unemployment rate is the high is is the highest of all, you know, the quintiles and 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 um, the various different ways you can cut the data. Um, what we also know is that, you know, like women are among the most who are completing the most years of schooling. So what we what we're also realizing by these statistics is that we're losing out on talent, which is exactly what Bill was speaking about. And so the urgency of dealing with gender is not only because women are at the very bottom of the pool, but next slide, Betty, because women, the, once it comes up, is because women, empowering women has a multiplier effect. And that's, I think, something that we are still going to see in our society and really hope to, um, through this presentation and many more, begin to probe the ways in which that can be done through competition law. Um, so I think on those points that uh, essentially around the urgency and, and the need behind getting uh, gender incorporated in our public interest consideration of competition issues, I, I think the stats speak for themselves. Thanks, Ibumi. Um, So I'll just now focus on some key lessons from South Africa in relation to the inclusion of public interest considerations and um, relating to gender. Um, our project really seeks to provide a reflective analysis of the role of public interest considerations in South Africa and to draw some key lessons for incorporating gendered public interest considerations in competition law. Um, and just to make sense of the effectiveness and success of the South African approach, we've identified um, four pillars. Um, and we'll just go through these pillars because we think these pillars really reflect why public interest considerations have worked in South Africa. And I think that it's important to sort of discuss what the measure of the success or what has worked is. And we think that um, what's important is assessing 
whether these public interest considerations have opened up access to markets for historically disadvantaged individuals and whether they've really um, enabled you know, historically disadvantaged individuals to participate more in the South African economy. Um, and so I'll just start with the first pillar. Um, the first pillar relates to the purposeful framing of public interest considerations in competition law. I think it's already been mentioned in this presentation or previous discussions that, you know, there are a number of countries that do have a public interest element to their competition law, but authorities don't really know how to implement those public interest considerations because there isn't a really clear um, and direct um, you know, view or objective on what those public interest considerations or whatever that element seeks to achieve. Um, and South Africa is very unique in this regard, considering its um, racial history, in that the agenda for the public interest considerations has always been very clear, which is to address the racially biased um, allocation of resources. And this is reflected in the major provisions. Um, and the major provisions have been the aspect of the act that has been very useful in addressing racial inequality, but also it's reflected now in the prohibited practices provisions of the Act. However, what is very key and unique from the South African approach um, is the broad embodiment of public interest considerations in the Competition Act's purpose and preamble, um, which has played a very key role in giving effect to these um, objectives of the Act. For example, it has allowed competition authorities to give effect to the purpose of the Act, um, at times going beyond the limited scope of some of the public interest grounds um, set out in certain provisions of the Competition Act. I mean, we do accept that this can be a bit controversial. Um, however, it is important for us to acknowledge you know, the powerful role of the preamble and the purpose of the Act in this regard. And this is particularly reflected in um, the major remedies that major parties have agreed to, either with the Ministry of Economic Development or competition authorities to advance the interests of historically disadvantaged individuals and to also open up access to markets for them and increasing their participation in um, key value chains. Um, the second pillar which Bill has really reflected on um, as well is the pillar of prioritization. Um, we've seen the South African Competition Authorities prioritize their enforcement and advocacy initiatives um, in relation to key economic sectors for the South African um, population and also on key equity related issues, for example, um, by assessing the extent to which a sector is able to contribute to the empowerment, entry and growth of SMMEs, especially those that are owned by historically disadvantaged um, individuals. And I think, um, so now I'll just move on to the next pillar, which we think is really an important pillar. And I think it's already been reflected on um, in, these, in the previous discussions. And I think um, it's really captured well by Michelle in her book as well about you know, the concept of stakeholder antitrust. Um, so the last pillar relates to um, sorry, before I go on to the last few, actually, I'm just getting too excited and ahead of myself. I'll just touch on the progressive impl implementation pillar. Um, and what that pillar does is really just recognize the importance of um, the approach adopted by South Africa, which really will reflect what other authorities do, which is that, um, you know, the implementation and enforcement of public interest considerations has to be, you know, done in sort of an incremental manner. Um, and this is very important because you do need to build um, the appetite for stakeholders to participate in this unique regulatory process, which we know, um, you know has not been um, an approach accepted by many either in business or practitioners in competition law or even academics. Um, so you really do need to build the appetite um, for this unique regulatory process. And also you do need to build the institutional capacity for the effective enforcement, which is something that South Africa has done. We started off with the major um, public interest considerations, and now we've sort of seen that there's room to you know, advance the same considerations in relation to prohibited practices. Um, and then on the last pillar, which is the progressionist participation, we think this is a very important pillar and it speaks to the role of stakeholders. Um, 
And these are stakeholders who have been very important and played a key role in championing for the enforcement of public interest considerations in South Africa. Um, and it's important that the, to note that the South African Competition Act actually creates room in the text for these stakeholders to participate in the enforcement process, particularly in relation to mergers. So for example, trade unions do have a right to participate in the merger process. In fact, they do receive um, a non-confidential version of the merger notification um, to the composition authorities. And the Minister of Economic Development also has you know, a right to participate in this process. And very important to note on their role is that they don't have the final say on you know, the decision in terms of public interest considerations. Um, they have a role where they make submissions to competition authorities. And I mean, we do recognize that in recent years, the Minister of Economic Development has played a very active role, which we think is very important um, in engaging with major parties on public interest considerations. Um, those engagements have to some extent sort of taken place outside of the processes of the competition authorities. However, it's important to note that the South African approach provides measures to sort of safeguard any abuse of the process in that major parties may agree conditions with the Minister of Economic Development, but those major conditions still have to be approved by the competition authorities. So if major parties were not happy with whatever conditions the minister may have sought, they actually do have a fora to engage with the competition authorities on those public interest considerations, which is very important. Um, but I think the engagements between major parties and you know, uh, the Minister of Economic Development really reflects the willingness of um, business and particular major parties to participate in this role and sort of give effect to these public interest considerations. Um, we do obviously accept that you know there are complexities um, in the minister's role in you know the the way that the public interest considerations are enforced and perhaps that shows that there's room for more development perhaps you know developing a framework that enables the minister to continue engaging with parties but have a framework that allows for transparency and certainty and predictability, which we think is that's what practitioners and business look for. Um, we don't think that people are opposed to the inclusion and enforcement of public interest considerations per se. So that's very important to note. Um, and just to sort of close up on that um, pillar, it's very important. What So what we've seen from the data is that um, the role of these stakeholders has been very important and without them we wouldn't the composition authorities wouldn't be able to determine on their own um, what interests uh, are, are very important and what kinds of remedies to impose in measures um, so in our research we're basically going to reflect more on these four pillars and how we can use them in order to realize um, gender inclusivity um, but very importantly, we do recognize that there are varied scales of willingness to incorporate public interest considerations in competition law for different countries. Um, and that the decision is really um, going to be um, affected by a number of interrelated choices that reflect each country's willingness to regulate and intervene in markets through competition law. Um, so I'll now hand over to my colleague Gumi, who will then reflect on our analysis of um, the inclusion of gender in competition law um, following the, the four pillars I've just discussed. Thank you, Betty. Thinking about the ways in which the South African experience can be repurposed, I think is so helpful when we think about how the wording of historically disadvantaged persons is used in the South African Act. And Coming back to this question of purposeful framing of PIs, um, what we thought really when we were reflecting on, you know, it's, it's that moonshot that Bill was talking about. What was the difference between the idea that we were going to incorporate public interest uh, considerations into our competition analysis and its ability to exist? Um, and as we've said, you know, we're, we're we're leaving aside the moments right now uh, for the mo for the moment those conversations about 
um, how successful it's been. Um, we posit it's been very successful. But what was what was in the institution? What was in the framework? What was in the act? What was with the stakeholders that really made this work? What made this happen? Um, and what we found just absolutely key is the fact that we have we have the verbiage, the the codification in the act, and as Betsy was speaking about how the purpose and the preamble enabled and capacitated you know the agencies to be able to take a more distributive view of um, efficiencies and think more about how rents are going to be redistributed when thinking perhaps about remedies um, that they can and have the authority to be able to open that box and say you know what, it is a question for competition authorities to understand exactly what you mean when you say, you know, you're imposing a, um, a supply condition in a merger, which firms will be benefiting from that supply condition um, and asking questions about who, is, what is the content pool of the new recipients of rents that have now kind of just been um, uh, opened up as a result of the uh, uh, the enforcement process through competition, so the purposeful framing of the PIs is is where I also add not just legislative instruments can be used, but as Bill was talking about the use of guidelines, the use of um, uh, update notes uh, from the chairperson of our tribunal, for example, can be used as means to communicate with the public on these issues. Because I think I saw a question pop up in the in the chat about legitimacy. And this is hugely, hugely a part of what South Africa had to deal with. Um, you know, the empire did strike back. Um, and how was South Africa able to still withhold and withstand what might have been transitional costs, the costs of changing people's understanding of exactly what competition regulation was going to do in this country, and how were they able to still hold the attention of the people that they police and the people that they serve. Um, and the one of the ways in which they did that, um, to jump around a little bit, is, and I'm going to go to my third point, but let's stay on the slide, Betty. One of the ways in which they did this was as we were talking about the progressive implementation. So the advantage of the South African experience is that uh, our PI enforcement collided with our new regime of all kinds of institutional reform that came with our democratic transition from the old authoritarian era. And so we were able to just bounce off that you know, that um, momentum to be able to slowly, creepingly bring in further focus on PIs. And as Betty said, you know, from an enforcement perspective, the, the agencies were focused on mergers for a long time. And that's why the jurisprudence around PI enforcement and mergers um, uh, and uh, it being a condition for merger assessment, that was the jurisprudence that developed first. Before that jurisprudence, as Bill said, prioritization was key um, in choosing what sectors to target from an enforcement ed agency perspective. What was chosen is the extent to which um, sectors, or this wasn't a dispositive factor, but it was a very important factor, is the extent to which that sector was going to contribute to empowerment. And so from a prioritization point, right at the beginning, you know, the South African democratic moment happens and everyone is brought onto the same page. We bring in further prioritization formally um, through, you know, the documents that are required, the frameworks that are required internally. We're talking about building that institutional capacity. Then we move on to our merger enforcement and slowly we see more and more the authorities flexing their muscles with the public interest conditions in mergers assessments and actually choosing to use the law that was there for them. Um, and then, oh, I see Bill saying he's not sure. Uh, but the, let's leave that for the debate. On to the progressionist participation. Um, one of the big things uh, that, as Betty said, we have identified as being key to, to how much reform we will see and how sustainable the reform can be is really as wide as your participation rights are. 
Um, and what we found is that the competition agencies in negotiation with the parties and then with those participants who were given uh, rights to be able to enter into the fray. Okay, not directly with me. Thanks, Bill. Um, uh, so by giving those rights to be able to come into the fray by key institutions and stakeholders who are going to champion the issues, we didn't have to know, well, I'm not speaking as a competition authority now, but the competition authorities don't have to know the answers to what the distributive outcome is going to be, the best answer is going to be. We just need to ask. We just need to make sure that we have legislated as as we, as we have done and i think that this is part of what is uh south africa's success in doing this is that we it is a legislative requirement that the minister and trade unions are brought into the fray um and and again we're coming back to what michelle asked earlier about um who are the key stakeholders that we should be inviting into our south african competition process who are who are maybe better able to enunciate um, the uh, impact of decisions on women. Um, and for example, you know, the slides are quite dense, so I can't get to everything. But on one of the previous slides, we were reflecting on the ways in which a recent market se a health sector market inquiry, perhaps, how would that inquiry have gone different had a more feminist lens been applied to understanding the market. Um, what are we doing when we talk about um, a back to this issue of prioritization? Because we're back on the slide. Is is um, again those sectors that are going to have high network effects for women? So, what are some of the ways in which in South Africa we could think about? mobilizing some of our more interventionist tools such as the market inquiry tool um, which on our stage of progressive implementation um, the market inquiry tool is being used more and more and more widely and more widely to be able to cultivate the space to have those more difficult discussions about resource allocation at the time at which rents become available for capture um, and the distributive element is what we found south africa has done so well in this in this regard something that we want to explore much further with our research in particular is looking at how um, public interest enforcement in south africa to date how has that actually been for women um, and what our thesis is and yet to be um, fully um, tested by the data that comes back is that it's probably going to be more black men or men of color who are benefiting from this prioritization of historically disadvantaged persons. And what this shows us again is the whole intersectional um, point, is that if we do not take on an intersectional um, approach to this, the most vulnerable members of the vulnerable group are going to be left out of the process. And uh, I think there are high dividends, as you know, maybe uh, the research um, enunciates, there are high dividends to empowering those who are at the very bottom. So choosing to prioritize women is not, you know, men are not worse off. Um, choosing to prioritize women um, means that we're choosing to prioritize consumer of general welfare um because helping women helps us all so again thinking about the four pillars i can talk more to the how i know that there's so much of the how that we want to get into and there's more on that question that i'd love to answer but i think it might be more helpful to engage with the questions that are coming in the comments um because clearly there's a strong debate happening there that i want to be part of um, and then, of course, to bring in our discussants, who we've had some very stimulating conversations with about how this can best be applied in contexts where perhaps the political settlement is not as amenable as the South African context to uh, inviting external participation um, in terms of capacity development and so forth. So I'm going to leave that there. Thank you very much, Mpumi. That was a um, very great presentation and uh, leads a lot to for for our discussants to to tackle i think so let's let's
move over to those. Um, we have Mary, Marie Hélène Brie from the uh, Canadian Competition Bureau and Oles Andrzejczuk from uh, the University of Strathclyde. So, uh, Mary, you want to go first? Sure. And uh, thanks. I can't begin to say how great it is to be part of this discussion and to, to listen to all these brilliant research proposals. You know, someone said it already. This is a milestone day. It's great. And yeah, we've had some discussions already with uh, Betty and Pumi about this topic. And it's, you know, they've all been absolutely great. Um, you know, the research here that, that Betty and Pumi and Sonia are, are doing is really interesting, especially, you know, from the perspective of a staff member of a competition agency that's very much sort of in the early stages of learning how our work and competition more broadly may benefit from a gender lens and how it can play a part in, in you know, producing inequalities. And looking at how South Africa applies its existing public interest principles in competition law, what's been successful and how that might be extended to include gender uh, will provide you know, valuable insights for agencies that are looking to develop an inclusive competition policy or to sort of figure out how to implement something along those lines. So you know, I'll, I'll try to flag a few, few of those opportunities and it'll be really interesting, right? For, for, because many agencies are coming from a different starting point, which, which has been raised where competition is you know, one of several elements or tools in government pursuit of public interest goals, which can you know, include promoting uh, equality, eliminating poverty, et cetera. But sort of limiting competition policy to more classical competition goals and analysis or like you know, ensuring equitable opportunity for small and medium sized enterprises and businesses. And generally the concept that competition is good for consumers and businesses writ large, right? That, that's already a, a general interest in competition policy. So this leaves more broader social goals to other government bodies and other government tools, but there's a growing understanding that you can't necessarily detach the two and that competition is, I'll steal a term from their presentation, sponge-like. Um, you know, so to frame that in my Canadian context, the main trigger I can point to that sort of started our research into the interaction between competition and gender was the broad implementation of the Canadian Public Service of what we call GBA plus or gender based analysis plus which uh, my colleague Ellen has already put a link in the chat if anyone's curious about it. Generally that, you know, this process asks public servants to consider how diverse groups and persons experience government policy and experience government programs and initiatives differently. And, you know, this analysis considers a number of identity factors like gender, but also race, religion, age, disability, sexual orientation, and so on. So the question was, you know, how do we apply this to competition policy and enforcement? And we're still trying to figure out how this analysis tool applies to our work and what it might mean for our work. And so this research here is a great opportunity for us to learn more from South Africa's unique experience and lessons learned and potential best practices. Uh, it's a good opportunity to think about how gender and identity intersects with other identity factors like race, also like age and so on, and to find value add in considering more key identity considerations. So specifically, you know, how would expanding the definition of HDP or considering the intersection with gender add to the agency's analytical quality, but also thinking about, you know, questions that might come up in terms of how does that add to the analytical burden or effort, you know, thinking of data requirements to make these determinations. You know, can a clearly framed mandate, so, you know, going back to that pillar one, to consider the in impact on historically discriminated persons and potentially on gender facilitate data collection, right? Does that make it easier to reach out to the market and say, we need this data, we need this information? And then speaking also of that pillar, I think exploring how, you know, this may, how this can be ex extended to gender, whether through clear legislative change or gradual application or jurisprudence, which may be a bit more of a natural flow for some agencies that don't already have a similar public interest consideration, you know, that can be valuable for, for us to sort of learn from and figure out how, you know, we might be able to sort of prioritize cases or do certain things like that to sort of apply our mandate, which may not be quite as clear cut to gender and having a gender lens on our competition analysis. So, you know, especially sort of try, trying to figure out how this might, this change could be driven, you know, how would buy-in be generated with key stakeholders? And so those questions that might arise and how that was driven in the first place when the public interest considerations were brought in and then bringing that towards including gender. So there, you know, there's a number of questions. I realize we're a little bit short on time. So, you know, if there's more time, I might ask a few more, but for now I'll pass it on to, to Oles. Thanks, Mary. Oles? Thank you very much. Uh, 
first of all, I would like also to echo my, my colleagues and friends and to, to congratulate OECD, the competition division for organizing such a fantastic, such a fantastic event. And I, I know you put forward so many uh, issues uh, to the kind of to the discussion in competition law community. And I'm very happy to see that competition and movement uh, is being enriched uh, with such an important dimension in competition and gender. So I, I'm an academic and uh, it is a given for me to, uh, what's that, what I teach my students at least, to uh, give, uh, you know, the room for both views. I would like to uh, articulate for the sake of clarity and for the sake of avoidance of any trivialization or glorification of, of the purpose uh, or, 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 of this, of, of this uh, seminar and of the movement as such, the counter arguments which are very likely to appear and which we observe now in, in, in the system movement in, in competition and sustainability. And one of the most, one of the most vibrant and um, appealing and difficult, uh, in my view, is the one that when we when we when we try to draw the parallels with uh, the, the 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 way how the South Africa South Africa addressing this issue, um, this pub inclusion of public interests uh, consideration into broader competition law uh, discourse, I think what is what is important to remember is that public interests are ipso facto national. Whereas when we're talking about gender and sustainability, we are talking about international dimension. And it is not unlikely that those, uh, you know, uh, least representative groups or countries could suffer when we, when we for example, when we talk about merger um, clearance, we can, you know, I, my special specialism is the digital economy mainly these days, as most of us. And we see that, you know, whatever legislation we design, uh, big tech companies manage to adjust best. So um, trying to extrapolate and look for looking forward at how these policies could be implemented in practice. I try to imagine the scenario and it looks to me quite plausible that the strongest companies would be able to contribute to some local, uh, you know, for fund or would be able to show evidence that they are better represented. Is it, is it the format which we should, uh, we should, we should seek to promote? Uh, the biggest part of my normative uh, standards tells me yes, uh, but I don't, I don't want us to be um, so excessively activists in, in, in trying to uh, forget this, 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 important, this important dimension. Uh, another issue which I wanted to, 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 to raise, if I still have a minute, is that uh, the issue of predictability and systematicity, because you can reinterpret uh, this factor as, you know, as, you know, people can definitely, those who have not been prioritized in, in, the, in the specific merger decision, they can, they can ask uh, for the metrics, how we calculate uh, the, the, the balance, this very difficult uh, balance with so many variables and so many unknowns. So obviously it's not the purpose of this exploratory pioneering uh, gathering to answer all these questions, but I, 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 I'm sure if we, if we really want to pursue the agenda uh, seriously and in the long run, all these challenges have to be addressed in all its scrupulousness. And lastly, looking at the theoretical kind of perspective, we definitely see this, the pendulum swing from, from this uh, you know, monistic perception of competition, of competition policy uh, being focused on microeconomic calculus, mathematized, and very, you know, measurable towards a more pluralistic, perhaps, vision, uh, which takes into consideration many, many, many factors which are not necessarily directly reflecting in competition policy sense so strict or in our traditional perception of, uh, of competition 
policy sense is stricter. And again, we, we see here many people who uh, uh, somehow say that by, by disproving the dominance of the neoclassical microeconomics, we automatically should open the door to all uh, other relevant meritorious considerations. So I think the important task now is to develop the algorithms, how precisely we do it. We, because by opening the doors, we have to design the, design the avenue. Uh, let me finish by, by, by expressing my sincere gratitude and congratulations for, for putting forward this really important topic. And I'm sure a lot has to be done in the future. And I'm glad to hear so many appealing, optimistic, and really competent ideas in, uh, at this event. Thank you, Olas. Very useful. Uh, and Pumi, um, Betty, would you like to respond to what you've heard? Yes, would love to. Thank yes. you. Um, you know, as you were talking, Olas, I was thinking about evidence. And I was thinking about how, how this kind of mathematization and kind of really intrinsically economically driven and very, as I say, data and, 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 and kind of mathsy version of competition and enforcement has indeed done a lot of creep. And I wonder how much of that leaves out the qualitative stories of women and people of color. And so when we think about evidence, I think when we think about creating evidence that is a, how do we, how do we understand the weight of evidence based on whether it was um, a qualitative story um, given by a person in the actual uh, a vulnerable group that we're trying to assess versus, you know, the, the piles of numbers that we sometimes have to look at. And so I think what this question raises is that I think we may need to have a rethink about how we understand evidence. And not that we have a legal rethink of how we understand evidence, because I think lawyers all know how to adjudge, you know, uh, people's narrative understandings of harm versus um, mathematical understandings. I think it's more of the economists who struggle um, with, with the challenge of perhaps choosing to approach um, what types of evidence we seek and the weight we place on various different types of evidence um, from a more inclusive uh, standpoint. So that's a question that we are constantly thinking about and wondering if there are ways in which we are predisposed to certain types of evidence that, as we said, maligns um, the experiences of those who are really vulnerable. And then that brings us to the point about analytical burden. So then now is this, you know, just a whole real big cognitive exercise in trying to figure out where to fit this in and how it works. And I think South Africa's lesson on this is that we don't have to have all the answers at the start. I don't think we need all the answers to begin. Um, and so when thinking about that analytical burden, it's through our jurisprudence that we had to really make the measure up. Um, our merger considerations contain what is usually the, you know, the competition uh, typical assessment in addition to a public interest assessment on multiple grounds of inclusion as well as development prioritization. And the question raised in one of the, the cases was in fact that, how do you strike that balance? Where is the balance? Um, and, and that's something that I believe, you know, depending on the political settlement, depending on the text of the act, um, and, the, and the face case that is before you, um, there's room to see how far we can push that. Um, uh, legitimacy, how do we build legitimacy um, at, at a stage when, you know, the current incumbent system has a lot of legitimacy as it is? Um, I think the first way to build legit legitimacy in that, in that uh, sense is to realize that there is definitely probably going to be some kind of pushback, but to bring your stakeholders on board 
Um, as Bill was talking about, you know, South Africa was great in creating its public interest conditions, the amount of meetings they held with stakeholders. And let's not underemphasize as well the stakeholders that are the representatives of the parties. I think that there's a lot that can be done about co-opting government through educating representative parties. So your lawyers, your economic firms, and teaching them and asking them for input um, on how they believe that things should be weighed up. So um, those are just some thoughts, uh, you know, rea immediate reactions. I wonder maybe if Betty has, has some further thoughts there. Yeah, um, I think just to reflect on a few, um, I think on the role of the legitimacy of the process, I think the approach that we've adopted in South Africa is actually quite unique um, in, in that the you know, the competition assessment is considered, for example, against the public interest assessment. So um, when competition authorities consider the, you know, the impact of a merger on a certain public interest consideration, that assessment is considered in light of the competition process, which really does bring some form of legitimacy in the process. Um, and the role of stakeholders as well. I mean, it's very true that the competition authorities don't know everything about the South African economy, especially the socioeconomic issues you know, what the government is focusing on, which industries um, have been impacted by a whole range of other things. And you have now have this merger before you that may actually, you know, exacerbate some of the harms in, in that particular industry. And that is where the role of the Ministry of Economic Development, for example, becomes very crucial because, you know, they're well aware of all the various issues that the South African government is seeking to address and their role alongside that of trade unions is, is very important. And like Mbumi mentioned, we're going to have to think really hard and broadly about the championing stakeholders for gender. Who are they? Um, and I think just on mentioning on that is that like we do have a gender commission in South Africa, but it's not been very active and it's not been used um, fully by the government. So an organization like that, for example, might have knowledge about, you know, and data on which industries women are participating in in South Africa. And that can inform how the competition authorities prioritize um, their, their efforts. Um, and then I think um, the the other thing that's very important to mention is the predictability and the systematicness of the process. Um, and that's been very important. I think having the comprehensive guidelines that we do have in South African public interest considerations has been very key. Um, and that the, you know, the public interest enforcement has also been very balanced. I think what what you know the one case that does reflect this is the Walmart and Messmart merger decision where the competition appeal court insisted on you know um, the major parties and the intervening stakeholders to present evidence to justify you know the conditions that were sort of put forward to address public interest considerations. And one useful example on this is that there was a fund um, that was created in order to address the public interest considerations or concerns in that merger relating to the impact of the merger on um, the value chains in South Africa. And the fund was going to benefit SMMEs, but a question came up about, you know, which SMMEs will benefit from that fund. And the CAC, the CAC made it clear that, you know, the historically disadvantaged individuals who operate or own SMMEs are the ones that, you know, need to um, benefit from um, from the fund. So it's so you can see that like there are measures you can put in place to safeguard the process and to sort of bring in some predictability in the process. And that really is informed by the text, which I mean we appreciate that not everyone can make legislative changes, but I think the approach that South Africa has shown us is that it's very important to set out in your text what it is that you are trying to, to achieve. Um, and like it's already been reflected on already, you know, this is a gradual process. And we think that there's a lot that can be learned by other countries on the approach followed from South Africa. So everyone does not have to start from scratch. Um, really, they can come in and pick and choose the elements that work for them. And obviously, you know, how we've approached things is informed by our national context, our history, and, and everyone needs to consider that, especially in terms of gender. I mean, I do accept that gender has a more, more of an international dynamic to it, but I think also it's very important to consider gender um, through the national lenses of each country, 
gender for a country like South Africa, you know, cannot be looked at as just gender alone. There's a very important element there, which is black women, which are really um, at the bottom of the barrel. If you look at the policies which were put in place that excluded, um, you know, historically disadvantaged individuals from participating in the South African economy. So you really need to think deeply about what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, and it's really great that there's a lot that you can learn and sort of pick out from, from the South African approach. On that, um, Betty, um, one thing I was thinking that uh, more of a comment than a question, I guess, is that I think what would be really interesting from your project is, is if we could dig down a little bit on the idea of how that um, uh, historically deprived person sort of test has been applied both for for uh, workers or owners of, of of businesses, I think that might be one way that we can um, pick out things that are perhaps a little more relevant for certain organisations coming from countries where in a different situation. So that might be one avenue uh, that's worth uh, worth thinking about. But I like this idea of you know picking and choosing from the, from the different aspects that you guys have, have worked on. Um, if I, uh, there's, been, there's been a bit of chat going along the side, but I'm, I'm not sure that there's so much questions as uh, come. So what I might do, if it's okay at this point, is to hand over to uh, the acting head of the competition uh, division at OECD, Antonio Capiabianco, who will uh, say a few closing words. Um, let me just, Finally, um, mentioned that, as we said before, LinkedIn group, further conversations on there. Uh, we'll also be holding a, a further event on, um, on gender. Um, we're going to be doing one, I think, on the 30th of March at a time zone that will be uh, in a time period that will be work better for those in the Asia Pacific region. So we'll try and do a, a short session there to kind of spread some of the discussion that we've had here. It's going to be very difficult to distill it down into a, <laughs> into a few hours, but we'll do our best. But that will all be advertised uh, separately. So with that, let me let me hand over to Antonio. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. And then uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, I should say maybe good evening. It's, it's getting dark here in Paris. Uh, and that's been a long, uh, a long day. Um, I have to say I'm particularly honored to close uh, the workshop, uh, this workshop on gender inclusive competition policy that has been so rich, uh, such a rich discussion, so many ideas, so many perspectives. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to listen to, to you all. I mean, each and every one of you have thanked my colleagues for, the, for, for creating the platform and I echo your, uh, your words, but it's, I think it's our turn to thank you all for the commitment and for the engagement and for the uh, willingness to participate to this, uh, to this discussion, very important discussion. Uh, and like Bill said in his presentations, uh, looking at competition enforcement and competition policy through a gender lens is part of a long-standing efforts of the OECD and of the competition committee at the OECD to explore the, link is, the links between competition and the many aspects of inclusiveness. Uh, Bill had a long list of roundtables. Uh, we are focused on, on the relationship between competition and poverty reduction. That was 2013. We've been looking at the relationship between competition and wealth and income uh, inequalities. That was 2017. Very recently, last December, we looked at sustainability uh, uh, and how it can or should be an integral part of competition policy. We will continue this discussion uh, this year where we look more closely at the role of our environmental consideration in antitrust enforcement. The very uh, last presentation from our um, colleagues from South Africa tells us that there are the, the other aspects of inequality that might be relevant for competition policy, and we might hope uh, to explore them, these racial inequalities. They were also mentioned by the acting chair of the USFTC uh, very recently. Uh, now, the analysis of the question of whether gender-related consideration should be taken into account by competition agencies started years ago. Uh, uh, Natalie uh, reminded us about the 2018 session at the Global Forum. Uh, now, this workshop today has brought together experts from all over the world to present uh, their work on gender-inclusive competition policy, and we hope that this will inform the OECD guidance on this topic. And I'll come back to this because the question of how do we do it uh, is part of what uh, this project is all about.
now as you as you know this project is part of a uh, of a you know, sort of the workshop is part of a project that was launched in the summer of 2020 with the support of the canadian government so i think i must start by thanking the canadian government for its vision and wisdom in supporting this work at the oecd um, but i want to thank uh, all of those who have enthusiastically responded to our call for papers uh, and i don't mean only the seven uh, projects that were discussed today but we received more than 60 proposals um, from 49 different groups of researchers from 28 different uh, countries. Proposals came from a very diverse mix uh, of professional backgrounds, academics, uh, staff and board members of competition authorities, private practitioners, and NGOs. So I really want to thank uh, each and every one of them for and able to encourage them to pursue their research. Uh, and I would like to offer them also the opportunity to disseminate their work through uh, our research platform on gender and competition here at the OECD. So we've heard in great detail and discussed in great detail the seven proposals that were presented here today. Uh, as you've seen, as you know, this project is still at an early stage, uh, but we expect the work to be finalized by this summer. And we are planning to organize a large public event in the fall to present and discuss the final papers. Uh, and we hope that the results of other people's work on the topic uh, will be ready by then and we would be more than happy to consider including that work as well in in our event uh, but there are different elements to the project that go beyond the research paper and this is where the question of how do we do this how do we translate this into concrete and practical uh, advice for agencies so we are going to develop a toolkit for the Canadian government on how to better integrate gender consideration in competition enforcement. Uh, we hope, uh, we truly hope that the OECD Competition Committee will be interested in and will wish to support and help guide this line of work to generalize this guidance and help in, to ensure that it applies beyond the specifics of the Canadian institutional setting. Now, coming to the, the, the extremely rich discussion today, it's very hard to summarize them. Uh, but you know we had really three main uh, we broke the, 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 the workshop in three main sections uh, the first uh, we started with cartels and collusion and we explored the relationship between collusion and diversity of corporate boards and senior management and asked whether a lack of uh, uh, diversity facilitates coordination and preserve cartel stability we look at whether there are gender differences in propensity to collude or to whistleblow and we will need to consider whether these are whether there are ways to improve enforcement and compliance in light of these insights i'm sure for example that we will take uh, the, the learnings from this discussion further into the work that we are planning on compliance programs uh, which we will be holding a round table on in june 2021. the second part of the workshop was on market definition and we explored how a gender lens may affect market definition analysis in merger reviews and generally in antitrust uh, investigations this explored the potential impact of using a gender lens when designing or interpreting consumer surveys or undertaking critical loss analysis and event studies commonly employed in market definition assessment. I can see how this discussion is relevant to most of our enforcement related work, uh, but just as an example of the intersection here, we can see the recent killer acquisition cases. By the way, we discussed this uh, yesterday at the open day have included uh, uh, so some cases have included the definition of a gendered product market and importantly without that definition the decision to block the merger might have well have been a different one so getting these things right um, is, is very uh, important and can make a difference uh, the, the last part of the workshop was on prioritization and public interest uh, uh, approach um, we looked at how agencies with a consumer welfare focus are using budgeting resource allocation and project selection decision to prioritize what they focus upon. Uh, I've taken a few notes here that will be very useful for us, for example, on our ongoing work on market studies and how agencies should select or prioritize sectors to review. Uh, we also look at the lessons that can be learned from the South Africans experience in using its competition law to address the country's past economic, social and racial disparities by assessing effects on historically disadvantaged persons this discussion links very well with past work in the Committee on Public Interest Considerations in Merger Review and more broadly with the role and objective of competition policy. So let me thank all the presenters, all the discussants and everyone else for the very interesting presentations and inspiring discussions, many of which happen on the chat, like, uh, like Chris uh, just mentioned.
Uh, let me thank all of you, the participants, for your contribution and active participation. Uh, I saw that we were more than 200 uh, to be connected today, which is a clear sign of uh, the great interest in the topic uh, and, of course, of its importance. Uh, final thought, and I will echo what everyone else has said, uh, goes to my colleagues, so Chris, Lynn, Despina, Isolde, Carlotta, Claudia, Becky, and Violetta, and I hope I haven't forgotten anyone who have put uh, really their heart and soul into uh, the, the, this work and the project and today's workshop. Uh, and the exceptional results of the workshop today are really a true credit to their dedication. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Uh, so with that, I wish you uh, a great end of your day, wherever you are. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you all and goodbye.